Well, hi, and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams, and I work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky, and I'm flying it solo today as Billy has the day off. But, you know, don't worry, because today on From the Woods, we are going to be celebrating a, a National Pollinator Week, which kicks off next week, June 21st through the 26th. And we're going to be talking to Tammy Horn Potter and her husband, Doug Potter, about bee swarms and bee basics. And following that, we will have Lori Thomas's Tree of the Week. And also um, then wrapping up the end is Megan Bulin will be joining us with What's That Fungus? So let's get started. So Tammy and Doug. Hi, welcome to the show. How are you all? Doing well. Good, how are you? Good, good. So could you tell me a little bit about your segment today? So um, when we were invited to speak, uh, we thought it would be a great opportunity to highlight swarms uh, because swarms and, and healthy trees have gone hand in hand for, for millennia and National Pollinator Week is next week. And so it seemed like there were a couple of different things that we could, we could talk about. And uh, we're just really pleased to be here. All right, wonderful. Well, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and give your presentation. So I think many people are uh, mystified and uh, terrified of swarms. And I, I wanted to just begin with a simple definition of swarming. Uh, a swarm is a, is a healthy colony's natural way to reproduce itself. Uh, we typically uh, think of reproduction in other types of forms, but for a honey beehive, um, it, it, it tends to happen in the spring when resources are plentiful. And by resources, I mean floral resources, when there are lots of things blooming. And of course, in Kentucky, that those are going to be flowering trees. Our orchards are blooming typically in April, uh, apple orchards and, and peach and cherry. Uh, we also have uh, other types of floral resources such as tulip poplar and basswood trees are blooming right now this week. And uh, when, those, uh, when those particular plants are blooming, um, the hive takes advantage of that. Uh, there are scout bees that bring in pollen and nectar, and those are the triggers for a mated queen to rear the next generation of queens. And she will begin to depart with 80%, 40 to 80% of adult worker bees. And she leaves behind uh, the next generation. And so that's what, I mean, most of the time people don't see what's going on inside the hive, they just see a swarm. Uh, there are a couple of conditions that have to happen prior to a queen leaving with her older workers. Uh, the hive typically tends to be about 40,000 bees. Uh, we've already mentioned the floral resources. Um, we've already mentioned a healthy mated queen. And the scout bees have done a lot of work prior to that group of bees leaving the hive. Uh, they will begin preparations of finding another place to, to move to two to four weeks prior to that swarm. And um, another trigger in the swarm pre preparation stage um, happens when uh, you have so many bees inside a hive and we have, a, we have some hives behind us. That's why we chose to um, have our camera out here. Um, the, the queen pheromone is the, the, probably the most important chemical inside a hive. Any hive is going to be a collection of chemicals. But when you have so many bees, um, sometimes that, that pheromone can get lost or it gets dispersed. And it's so scarce that um, the, the hive begins then to make preparations for a new queen and the scout bees will begin to find a new home. Uh, it's just simply become so crowded, they need to, to depart. Um, I compare it to a freshman dorm. Um, at some point, you just have to make a split. Um, the, the other thing that will happen too inside the hive is a mated queen is getting ready to fly, and so she has to lose weight. And so the worker bees will actually um, kind of withhold food from her and they'll force her to exercise a little bit so she loses a little weight because she does have to fly um, and then in the meantime the worker bees you know her daughters are consuming 
honey, they are gaining weight because they are going to need energy uh, not only to fly to a new location, but also to build beeswax once they get to that new location and get a second home established. So uh, this is a picture of a swarm that landed on a hive. Uh, you can see here at the top, um, this, this particular swarm had two uh, other virgin daughter, uh, virgin queens. That, and this is one queen that I caught. There's another queen over here. Uh, and this is actually one of the smaller uh, swarms that we did catch. Um, and I just wanted to kind of mention that there are some advantages to, to this type of reproduction. One, uh, it, it leaves the next generation with plenty of young bees, a young queen, and plenty of nutrition. Um, so it is a controlled type of, of reproduction. Um, you don't have a young queen trying to get all of these things in place. She's already got her, um, her next generation ready to take care of her. Uh, the second advantage is that um, it can reduce a, a type of mite that causes uh, transfers viruses to bees. Um, and so it ends up being a healthy um, stage for the next generation. They don't, they don't have a lot of mites on them. And then, and then the next advantage is for humans. It means for us free bees if we are able to, to catch the swarm. There are some disadvantages, as you can imagine. Anytime a queen and bee leave a hive, uh, they are subject to, you know, birds, uh, you know, wanting a snack uh, midair. So um, a young queen may not return to a hive to begin to rear that generation. Uh, the, the biggest problem, the biggest disadvantage that a beekeeper sees from a swarm is that the honey crop is gone. Uh, the worker bees uh, that leave with the mated queen will consume at least half of the honey crop. And so for a beekeeper, it means that that's a reduction of their honey harvest. And so our heart kind of sinks when we see a swarm because we're like, oh, there, there goes my honey profit for the year. And then, you know, the other disadvantage is that until a new young queen gets laying, um, that, that hive is vulnerable to pest and pathogen pressures. We won't get into that uh, today. That's a little bit more inside baseball but it, it, there are some disadvantages to this type of reproduction. Uh, from a beekeeper's perspective, there are some clues that we can see, although it's still a mystery, swarming is still a mystery to beekeepers. Um, we can look for queen cups. If there is larva inside these queen cups, that, that tells us um, they're beginning to build um, a queen cell. A queen cell will look like this, sort of like a peanut. Uh, typically, like I said, on the bottom of these bars, and that's our that's our first wake up call. Like, okay, these bees are prepping to swarm. They're pretty crowded. There's a lot of resources coming in, and we can try to control that. Um, but most of the time, especially if they get to this stage, if we see this and these cells end up being capped over, there's nothing you can do as a beekeeper. You just have to let them go. We can also hear cues that tell us that a swarm is preparing. Um, you know, you can hear this sound called piping. And I kind of, I used to play piccolo in high school and it's that pitch. You can hear a queen piping to her workers. You can hear her piping to daughters. Worker bees can also pipe. And this is their form of communication. Some people speculate that it is a trigger for the worker bees to begin warming up their flight muscles. They can't simply just come out the front of the hive and immediately um, begin to fly. They have to warm up their flight muscles. Um, but sometimes in the case of a rain, you know, a sudden downpour, um, the, the hive can't, the swarm can't leave. And so they'll pipe amongst themselves. Um, Scout bees are the critical uh, factor in a successful swarm. As I mentioned, they've started two weeks prior. They're looking for certain things. They're looking for a cavity size of a certain measurement. They're looking for a certain distance off the ground, too low that, that, 
that um, subjects them to raccoons and skunks and, and other predators. They like south facing entrances. They like a cavity size of about 40 liters. Um, they, they um, you know, there's a whole dance communication that happens. Um, if you're interested in this, um, I will uh, give you the reference at the end of this presentation, but Tom Seeley's Honey Bee Democracy is my husband and, and my favorite book when it comes to um, the topic of swarming. Um, here are some more specifics, you know, uh, and again, these are generalities. Um, anything can change in the field. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, just kind of take this for what it's worth. Um, but the distance and alternative sites need to, the idea here is that the swarm wants to be sufficiently far enough away from the home hive so that the young queen that emerges doesn't mate with drones from her own hive. You know, they're trying to get far enough away. Um, and so the scouts will offer three or four sites to their sisters. And then there's this negotiation process that has to happen. Um, you know, th there's some politicking that has to happen. A scout that is really crazy about one site has to waggle a lot more. She has to do some recruiting and get her sisters on her side. And if it's a weak site, then that worker will tend to not try to outdance her sister. Um, the whole point here is that there's a lot of communication that happens and hence the nature of the title of the book, Honeybee Democracy. There's a lot of communication that has to happen because when that swarm leaves the hive, it is in peril. And so they need to know before they leave the hive where they're going. And so there's complete support typically and uh, the support for a poor site will fade away as more scouts are sent to a really good location and they too come back and begin to show their support by more vigorous dancing. And so this is just a page that I've taken from Honey uh, Bee Democracy, which shows you that approximately at 10 a.m. you have one scout that goes to this site and another scout that goes to this site. And then they come back and they begin their recruitment process. But by 1 p.m., this, this scout bee has been successful in showing that her site is more preferable. See, it has a smaller entrance size. Uh, that's, one, that's less defense that is needed for the bees that will be re relocating inside. They don't have to work as hard to defend it. They don't have to work as hard to keep it warmer in the winter time. So, uh, but, but there's some holdouts here, right? It's not complete support yet. So, um, so then finally by 4 p.m., you know, even more sisters have gone to this site and said, okay, we like this site. It's a little bit like when you move to a neighborhood, right? You're going to not look just just buy a house in the first neighborhood you come to, you're going to go to three or four. You're going to look at the schools. You're going to consider the distance to the grocery store. You're going to consider other amenities. And there'll be a decision-making process that will happen with a family before you decide which house you want to put um, an offer on. And it's the same with honeybees. Here's some more generalities. Uh, swarms typically occur between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., although my husband has put field cameras out, and we've seen swarms happening at 9 a.m., I think, and, and um, as late as 4 p.m. Uh, swarms can have multiple queens. Some of those are virgin queens that just get caught up in the rush outside the hive. Um, and, and, you know, just this is a tip for beekeepers who may be watching. If you're trying to catch a swarm, the interior of this swarm can be very warm, exceedingly warm. And so the queen will come out and cool herself off and she'll walk around here amongst her bees. And that's a good opportunity to catch her if, if you can. But I want to just kind of caution people that, you know, swarms are risky business for a hive to undertake. 
Um, and scout bees are not perfect. Um, she, you know, again, the queen can be lost whilst, while they are in transit. There can be aerial challenges such, such as pesticide drift or rain can happen while they are in, in flight. Um, this statistic, if there's a take home here, I would like for people to remember, only one in four swarms will survive, only one in four. So, um, you know, this is, it, it's, it's problematic. Um, and when beekeepers want to catch swarms, I encourage them to. I do maintain a swarm catching list for the entire state. And I encourage people who may see one not to kill it if possible. Sometimes it's not possible, but if you can, I, you know, we'll try to find somebody to go, to go get those bees. But this slide is a, is, shows you some places where swarms have set up. And uh, one, of course, uh, shut down a Reds baseball game. <laughs> and the other, uh, the swarm somehow did not go inside the nook, book, uh, the nook box. It settled here on the pail. And, um, and so you'll, you'll see like there's been swarms that take up inside dog houses. Um, so they can be anywhere. And I wanted to just kind of share a trick with your uh, viewers. My husband um, was looking on an Australian beekeeping website. And of course, they have those long, lovely pines in Australia, which we have some in, in our backyards. And so um, what he does is create a lure uh, with about a 50-50 mix of nasanol pheromone and lemongrass oil. Um, there's a product called Swarm Commander that's the very same thing. It's available at bee vendor supply stores, but you can make your own. Um, and we put the lure in on the bow of the tree. And this is a pipe, a PVC pipe that simply holds this bow stable so that it can withstand the weight of a swarm. And then um, once the swarm has settled, and we feel comfortable that all of the straggler bees are on that limb, then he will pick it up or I will pick it up and we will put it into our, um, our, our, our hive there ready to go. And we do have a short video clip, which Renee, I will turn to you if you wouldn't mind pushing play. <laughs> And you notice I wasn't wearing gloves in that particular scene. Uh, swarms tend not to be defensive. They do not have a home to defend. And so, uh, you know, by now I tend to work more efficiently if I'm not wearing gloves. But that is, that I, I want to be clear, I don't want people to think that they shouldn't wear gloves. If you're not comfortable with these, you should definitely be wearing a full suit, hive, veil, and gloves. After, uh, after we have um, been successful in getting a swarm into a, a hive, we'll give her some time. Uh, we'll give that swarm some time, but we want to check and make sure that the, that the mother queen is laying. And um, of course, here is a queen for those viewers who, who maybe aren't accustomed to looking for what a queen uh, may look like and how she's different from her daughters. She has a longer abdomen. Her wings typically tend to be straight back. Um, and what we're looking for specifically are eggs. We want to know that she is in fact laying. Oh, and for that matter, the young queen, the one that she leaves behind, uh, will wait about two weeks and make sure that she gets mated and come back and just make sure that there is a queen, she's mated and that they're laying one egg per cell directly in the center of the cell. Sometimes, you can have these situations where two queens may be in the same hive, a mother and a daughter. There's a lot we don't know about on this score, but it is, it can happen, I think more often than what we are aware of. And um, some other things, some, some tips here with swarm traps for those um, viewers who are wanting to create your own swarm traps that aren't like the, the Australian pine bough. Color does matter for swarm traps, 
Um, they tend to go to swarm, swarm traps that are camouflage color, and they are more successful if they are on the edges of forests. That Australian pine bough method that we showed you will not work in the middle of June and July. It's too hot, too much sun. So there's a seasonality to swarm traps as well. Um, drawn comb, and by what I mean by that is comb that has established beeswax cells on it. Is It's a great attractant, but you can't leave it for very long because it will attract other pests. Foresters will appreciate that a line throw and a weight line is very handy towards, you know, uh, if a swarm has taken up residence on a branch, you can pull that towards you. Uh, a spray bottle with some sugar syrup is very handy, loppers. Um, and then what Doug and I do is move a hive swarm at night or first thing in the morning, like 5 a.m. in the morning uh, to a new location because those scout bees sometimes are still in politicking mode. And, and if you come in and interrupt it and say, here, I have a better place for you, um, you know, the scout bees may say, mm, I don't know about this. And so they may leave. And so we do try to kind of curtail that that scout mode by moving a swarm uh, before, uh, you know, before the next day. If it's super hot outside, because sometimes May, we can have temps in the 90s, you'll want to insert wet sponges. Um, but, but the big thing that I want people to realize is that swarms typically are not defensive. They do not have a home. Uh, they are in transit. Uh, so they're not an immediate threat in Kentucky. I do maintain a swarm removal specialist list for the entire state. If a swarm moves into a structure, which sometimes they can do, you want to, to make sure and have an insured swarm removal specialist. You don't want just somebody who's pulling swarms off limbs to come in and cut open you know, walls in your home or have to change you know, electricians or things like that. Um, and then some takeaways here from honeybee democracy that I thought would be applicable to say a wider group of people is that swarms are really successful when their communication is strong. And I think for people, it's a good reminder of that. Um, Seeley ends his book with talking about swarm smarts and he uses a New England small town meeting as a, as a good protocol for communication, that you have open and fair competition of ideas, such as what the scouts do when they're recruiting, um, that you have a communication style that brings all members to a consensus, and that, and that you have critical thinking and flexible attitudes for the good of the community. Those to me are, are, are handy reminders um, for, for what we need to do in our own workplaces and our own home places. So here are the resources that um, I mentioned and I used in the, the compilation of this presentation. Here is my communication or my um, oh, methods of communication that people may want to, if they want to reach out to me. And then also my husband's, he has been uncharacteristically quiet well, I've been giving this presentation, but <laughs> maybe I can turn it over to him or if there are some questions from your viewers, we'd be happy to answer them. Well, thank you very much. We greatly appreciate you doing that. And um, so, um, Doug, I mean, I, you, you collect honey as well, right? Correct, yeah. <clears throat> I guess the only thing I would say to, to forestry owners is if you see a clump of bees hanging in a tree, it's really no cause for alarm. Mm -hmm. they're, they're generally gonna be there anywhere from a couple hours to a couple days, but that is, a, that is not their permanent home. It's just a bivouac where they're gonna stay for a while until they figure out where they're moving permanently. Uh, and they're generally not defensive and you know, unless you have grandchildren who are allergic to bees or something, there's really not much to worry about. Right, I think a lot of people, they see that big swarm and they worry about that you know um and they worry something's going to happen if they if they're in their tree or what have you so is the so i guess the best thing if they don't have anyone to call is just to leave them alone yeah and they'll generally depart you know like i say a couple hours a couple days it could, it could be a little while but they, they will take off on their own and they, they take care of themselves and they don't harm anybody in the, in the meantime generally 
there, there is an exception to that. And that is that if, a, as, as your audience will know, a tree will decay from the inside. And so that provides a perfect cavity for them to take up residence. And so sometimes um, that can be problematic on, in a homeowner's um, property if that tree is close to the home. Um, and so that requires a type of, of removal called a trap out. And not every swarm removal specialist can do a trap out. It takes a while, but, um, but there, that can happen. But typically, a, a, you know, even a swarm inside a tree is not a threat. I mean, they, they, they don't want to attack. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. We greatly appreciate you all being on. Sure. Thanks for having us. All right. Well, we're moving on today to our new uh, tree of the week, and it's sourwood. And from what I understand, bees love sourwood as well, sourwood trees. And so Lori Thomas may, is not here today, but she did say uh, create us a tree of the week. And like I said, it's called sourwood. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with that. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the sourwood. Sourwood, Oxydendrum arboreum, is a member of the Ericaceae or Heath family. It is the only species in the Oxydendrum genus. It is also known as sorrel tree or lily of the valley tree. Sourwood is a small to medium sized tree that grows 40 to 60 feet tall and about 8 to 15 inches in diameter. It reaches its largest size on the western slopes of the Smoky Mountains. Sourwood develops a slender trunk and a small crown in dense stands. In more open situations, it forms a short, often leaning trunk dividing into several stout ascending limbs. It is a beautiful landscape tree and the flowers are an important source for honey production. Sourwood is native to the upland forest of the southeastern United States. Like most of the Ericaceae, sourwood generally does not grow on soils of limestone origin, but is most commonly found growing in slightly acidic, well-drained soils. It is classified as somewhat shade tolerant. Sourwood is an understory to mid canopy tree in numerous upland forest types that include post, chestnut, black, and white oak, as well as Virginia, shortleaf, and loblolly pine. Sourwood is a deciduous tree with alternately arranged leaves, as you can see in the photo. The leaves are simple in form, lance-shaped about four to seven inches long, and the leaf margins are finely serrated, and the underside midrib has small hairs. The leaves are green above and pale below, and fall color is outstanding, with colors ranging from red to purple to yellow, and these can often be found on the same tree. And the leaves have a sour taste when chewed. Sourwood is monoecious with small white flowers. The flowers are about a fourth of an inch long and they're kind of urn shaped and they're in drooping panicles and the flowers resemble lily of the valley flowers. The panicles of flowers have also been said to resemble a bony witch's hand. It is one of the latest flowering trees with flowering occurring from late June to August. The flowers are insect pollinated, thus an important source for honey production in some areas. The fruit is a very small capsule. The five valved capsules are between one fourth and a half an inch long and they're in those drooping panicles. When the capsules mature, they are dry and they split open and release very tiny two winged seeds. Fruit mature in the fall between September and October and the seeds are gradually dispersed through winter by wind. Sourwood is also capable of vegetative reproduction through stump and root crown sprouting. It is a prolific sprouter. The bark is grayish brown. It is very thick and has deep furrows and scaly ridges. The ridges are often broken into identifiable rectangles. The wood of sourwood is hard and close grained. The heartwood is a reddish brown and the sapwood is paler. Sourwood is not a commercially important timber tree, but the wood is used locally for tool handles, fuel, and mixed with other hardwoods for pulp. The wood was once used for wagon sled runners. Sourwood flowers are very attractive to bees and sourwood honey is common in the south. The honey has a medium to light color with a heavy body and it's slow to granulate. The flowers are attractive to butterflies and other insects. Natural hollows and older trees provide shelter for climbing reptiles and amphibians, bats, and other small wildlife. Sourwood is one of the species that is host for the fall webworm tents. The caterpillars in the tents attract birds by providing fall invertebrate food. 
Flowers are quite attractive to bees and the honey is highly sought after. Sourwood is a great specimen tree. It's basically a tree for all seasons. It has lovely abundant flowers that open in midsummer and they curve upward creating a graceful effect at flowering time. There's excellent fall colors, some of the best in the south. The colors range from red to purple to yellow and the hanging panicles of fruit capsules provide winter appeal. The national champion sourwood is in Amelia, Virginia. It's 130 inches in circumference, 74 feet tall, with a 47 foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion sourwood is in Bell County at the Cumberland Gap National Park. It's 68 inches in circumference, 66 feet tall, with a 32 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about sourwood. The flower blooms resemble lily of the valley flowers, hence one of its other common names, lily of the valley tree. The name sourwood is de derived from the sour, pungent taste of the leaves. The Cherokee and the Catawba used the shoots of sourwood to make arrow shafts. Pioneers used the sap as one ingredient in a concoction used for treating fevers, the bark for chewing to soothe mouth pains, and a leaf tea for treating intestinal discomforts. The scientific genus name Oxydendrum comes from the Greek words oxys and dendron, which mean acid tree, and it refers to the sour taste of the leaves. I'm glad you joined me to learn about the sourwood, and I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy the stunning sourwood. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that um, presentation. It looks like we had a really good presentation there with the bees and the sourwood. And uh, Dr. Crocker is on here as well to give us a little more information. Yeah, and I'm curious uh, from Tammy and Doug, what is um, the honey? of sourwood taste like, because I know it's a, it's a popular one. But one thing I wanted to note is that um, it mentioned the flowers. Oh, Tammy's on, so she can address her question. We want to know, what does the honey taste like? I think it tastes just like the lily of the valley. Um, you know, it's got a very deep floral, uh, floral presence. It is, it is unusual. Um, it is unlike anything else, like clover honey. Uh, it tends to be a little bit more common in this area, uh, but sourwood is is definitely distinctive. And once you've had it, it you know you you kind of get imprinted with that taste, and it can be difficult to find. Well, now you've made me hungry, and I want to try some of this honey. So, <laughs> <laughs> is there a place that people can purchase honey uh, from from different Kentucky uh, 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 producers? Oh, yes. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were going to ask me if there's a place you can purchase sourwood honey. <laughs> sourwood is a, a notoriously unreliable uh, tree. Uh, you'll get a good sourwood crop about once every five years. And so you can't count on it giving um, you a harvest um, every year. Um, but but uh, to answer your question, if there is a place where people can purchase honey from Kentucky beekeepers, uh, there is. Uh, it would there uh, the Kentucky State Beekeepers Association has a website and you can go there and find you know you can punch in your information and find an area beekeeper that's close to you um, and we've also the State Beekeepers Association has started um, a certified Kentucky honey program so that people who are really interested in having honey from this state um, you can find a, a local producer, so. Great, oh, those are good resources. Yes. How do they Thank tell you. if the, what kind of honey it is? Uh, that's a great question, Renee. And again, to go back to sourwood, one of the reasons why it's such a difficult type of honey to type, quote unquote type, is that the tree itself produces very few pollen grains. In order for a beekeeper to classify his or her, her, his or her honey as a varietal, they have to have, that honey has to have 46% uh, of one pollen grain. So, you know, with my honey, for instance, last year, you know, I had 76% of the pollen grains were clover. So I could market it as a clover honey. 
Um, but most Kentucky honeys are wildflower honey because our honeys are, you know, are pull in a number of pollens from different types of floral resources, trees and wildflowers and cultivars. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And I have one more fun fact about um, sourwood that this time of year, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a different flowering tree and I sometimes get confused. Um, so right about now, American chestnut is blooming. Um, Chinese chestnut is also bloomed just before American chestnut. So this time of year is a great time to be scouting around for chestnut. And if you look, you can still find American chestnut and the Kentucky chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation is actively looking for those and would love to hear about them if you find some large American chestnuts that are flowering. Um, so as you're scouting around and looking for flowers, uh, this is a, a species that I'll sometimes get confused with and I'll see those blooms and I'll think, oh, that's a chestnut. Oh, wait, it's not a chestnut. <laughs> so something to add to your, your scouting list this week is to, to keep your eyes peeled for some American chestnut. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. All right, so moving on, we have a uh, what is that fungus? And Ellen and Megan Bulin. Megan, if you want to come on. Um, yes, Megan's going to take us on a, a journey to the woods and show us maybe one of the scariest mushrooms that we have in our area. So yeah. if you've heard <laughs> tales of, of deadly mushrooms, uh, this, is, this is one for your nightmares, right, Megan? <laughs> Oh yeah, this is a mushroom that um, is very commonly seen growing in Kentucky. About this time of year, you'll start to see it fruit. And it's a mushroom that it's, it's very interesting, but one that you also want to be very aware of so that you don't mistakenly harvest it when you're out looking for fungi. Maybe while we get that going, um, uh, we can comment on this. This is this mushroom. The reason why um, it's one of the most deadly mushrooms is that it's frequently confused with some other species um, that people do eat in other parts of the world. Um, so kind of a, a, a tip there that just because it looks similar in a photo does not mean you should eat it, right? <laughs> That's right. You know, mushrooms can be really deceptive in the way that they look. And there are fungi that grow in one region that look remarkably similar to a mushroom that grows in another region of the country that can be very toxic. Uh, so understanding not just how to identify a mushroom, but what mushrooms grow in your region of the country can be really important. This beautiful white mushroom is Amanita bisporidura, and this is the destroying angel mushroom. It's a rather infamous mushroom. You may have heard of it. Every year, this little guy is responsible for at least several deaths uh, from people consuming this mushroom, believing it to be edible, when in fact, this is one of the most deadly poisonous mushrooms that we have here in North America. Amanita bisporidra is, as you may have guessed, a member of the Amanita group. Is, this is evident by the bulbous base to this mushroom, as well as the annulus that surrounds the stipe. These are classic features of Amanita fungi. Now keep in mind that not all Amanitas have these features. And there are other mushrooms aside from Amanita that will have that bulbous base or that will have an annulus. But those two features together are very um, characteristic of Amanita fungi. The Destroying Angel is a beautiful, pure white mushroom. There are no other colors on this mushroom when it is pristine and in good shape. It will be completely pure white. It has a very long stipe, uh, that annulus and that bulbous base, and the spore print on this mushroom would be white. This is a mushroom that you never want to eat. And if it is a mushroom that by some chance you believe you may have consumed, you do want to seek immediate medical attention because this mushroom is, is deadly poisonous. Despite its reputation as a deadly poisonous mushroom, this mushroom is only poisonous if you ingest it. Touching this mushroom will not hurt you. It's not something that can be absorbed through your skin, although I would advise not licking your hands after you've been handling any mushrooms ever. Great, thanks, Megan. And uh, you know, that's that's a scary one. And I think one of the reasons why I advise people, you know, never just pick something and then try to figure out if you can eat it, because uh, you can read online the stories of people who have ingested this and live to tell the tale, and it is pretty gruesome. 
That's right. You should always be really uh, cautious of what it is that you're harvesting. Double and even triple check your IDs and triple check those IDs to be very reliable sources. You know, there's a lot of, uh, of sources that will be very happy to tell you, oh, I think that this mushroom is you know, species A or species B, but you really want to be very certain. So having multiple sources that you can draw from books, uh, reputable um, sources online, and there are a few, uh, are all great places to start. And this doesn't just apply to mushrooms that you harvest yourself. This is a time of year when a lot of people like to go out and are foraging in the woods. And, you know, maybe you have someone who presents you with this bag of mushrooms and say, oh, I picked these in the woods. They are delicious. I love this kind. And you know what? Maybe there's some good mushrooms in there, but it's always best, no matter how, how much you trust this person to go through and double check, just to be sure that you know what everything in that bag is. When I go foraging, after I come, I check everything in the field and then I come home and I double check it again before I do anything with those mushrooms. So they've been checked like three times before anything happens with them because you just can't be too careful. Yeah, and with this one, the toxin that's in it um, basically requires a, a liver or kidney transplant, right? Uh, that's that's, that's right. your best bet if you even have a few bites. So we don't want to go there. You know, there are lots of great mushrooms that you can safely consume. You can buy them at the grocery store. It's not worth the risk. <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, it's, that's what I tell people a lot of the time when these kinds of uh, uh, topics come up is I'm quite very attached to my kidneys and my liver and no meal is worth possibly damaging uh, your internal organs over. So better to be safe. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Megan. Yeah, I was going to ask you about touching it, but you addressed it in the video. So yeah, are there other <laughs> mushrooms that are that toxic? There are, there are. We have uh, several other species in North America that are just as toxic. Um, the death cap mushroom and the deadly gallerina are the two that are most commonly uh, run across that people have issues with. There are several others as well, but they're less likely to, uh, to be the ones that people consume. Unfortunately, this one looks very similar to a species in Southeast Asia and in other parts of the world, especially when it's first emerging. So people can confuse it that way. Um, uh, that's a common one. But by far, the most common way that people uh, get sick from mushrooms isn't necessarily those deadly poisonous ones, although obviously they're a concern. Um, but maybe those mushrooms that um, just make you really sick and you'll really wish you hadn't eaten it, um, or mushrooms that were prepared improperly, so you got an edible mushroom, maybe even from the grocery store, and it wasn't fully cooked, or um, it had some contaminating, you know, bacteria on it, um, because mushrooms, they grow in the soil, right, and in other things that maybe we don't want to eat. Um, so there are lots of tips for if you want to eat mushrooms, um, how to do that safely. Well, maybe that sounds like a, a, no, a new show, tips for eating mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now we have lots of mushrooms popping up. So I'm sure next month we're going to have another exciting uh, edition of this segment. Um, what you're seeing in the woods right now. What's that fungus? So Megan, we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, that's all we have for today. And we greatly appreciate, um, I appreciate Ellen helping me fill in for Billy Thomas and um, all of our guests, the Potters and also Megan and Lori to be able to help us uh, do our show um, as best as we can. Again, if you have any uh, topic suggestions, you're more than welcome to email them to us. Um, if you go to fromthewoodstoday.com, there is a link there that you can submit pictures. So we've actually had a show based on somebody that had sent a picture. I know uh, Dr. Springer, he has done a snake ID on that. So um, if you have anything that you want to uh, let us know about, please do. And uh, again, all of our shows are on fromthewoodstoday.com. So you can look and see if anything that you may want to rewatch. So until then, we greatly appreciate you joining us and we couldn't do it without you. So take care. <laughs>